What's up YouTubers and plant lovers? It's Justin and today I was going to show you how I transplant my fiddle leaf fig. Now the scientific name is Ficus lorata, but I've heard it called the fiddle leaf fig and the banjo fig. Uh, but as you can tell mine isn't really doing that well. I should explain a little bit of background about this plant. Uh, I got him probably about five years ago. At the time I was working the return desk at Lowe's and this gentleman brought it in and uh, I believe they were like a foot tall that they were selling for around $15 at Lowe's. Uh, but this guy only had three leaves and looked horrible and sad. Uh, and it was the first time that I had ever seen one. I had like seen them advertised and on Pinterest and uh, all kinds of social media sites, but I hadn't actually had one yet. Uh, so I grabbed it and uh, luckily it was didn't look the best, so uh, the person there at Lowe's sold it to me for a dollar. Uh, but since then, he's put on a lot of mass. Uh, and typically, they really do have kind of finicky branches and stems uh, that don't really branch out a whole lot. Uh, but you got to be really careful with them because I've heard it time and time and time again that these plants are fussy and they're divas and uh, it's a lot harder to take care of them than you could ever imagine. Well, that can be true. It really can be. Uh, but if you know a little bit of background information on the plant, i.e. where it comes from, uh, being able to kind of closely recreate those uh, conditions in your home will really help you out tremendously. Uh, like I said, they are from the tropical kind of jungles of Western Africa. Uh, so typically they get a lot of humidity, a lot of rain, uh, and they don't get a whole bunch of uh, light. They get mostly kind of brightly filtered light because they only get to be about 50 feet tall, somewhere around there. Um, so they don't really come up past a lot of other trees' crowns, uh, but uh, they do get some light, and uh, the light they do is always filtered kind of uh, soft light. Um, but I have mine in a southeast, or excuse me, a south facing window, and I've got him scooted back about two feet. Uh, and my house doesn't get a whole bunch of light, uh, but it's helped him out some. Uh, and I've also been rotating him because I know a lot of you will be like, When did you rotate your plant? Yes, I rotated my plant. Uh, and I scooted him back, so I may need to get him a little bit closer, uh, but I also got one of these sturdy stakes. These things are incredible, too. Let me tell you, Lowe's also sells them. I believe Home Depot does, uh, and they're great to have, not just for, like, stringing up green beans, uh, but also keeping trees straight. Uh, they coat them in plastic, so it's kind of soft and malleable and won't really kind of hurt your plant. But the inside of the core of the sturdy stake is actually steel. So you don't have to worry about like the wind blowing it and breaking it and anything like that. And they sold it for like $3. So it's not expensive at all. Uh, and they've got these grooves in here that'll help you if you've got your gardening twine and you want to secure your plant. Uh, so I recommend going out and getting one of these instead of maybe just like a wooden stake or whatever. Uh, but to each his own, you know, this was great and what I needed. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, repot him and hopefully kind of tie him up and secure him. Uh, I've got him in a 6 inch pot and I've just bought a 10 inch pot that I want to put him in to kind of get him uh, a little bit more room around the root mass. Because uh, right up there with everyone saying that these are finicky divas, uh, the root mass on these bad boys are intense and crazy. Uh, so a lot of Growers, particularly experienced growers like myself, uh, get intimidated from repotting these guys just because they are divas and they are fussy and they do have a crazy, scary kind of root mass uh, hidden in this pot. So it can be a little bit of an undertaking, uh, but if you know what you're doing and you've done it before and you have help or uh, you know somebody that's done it before, i.e. me, uh, then it's not that bad. Uh, so don't feel like you're biting off more than you can chew or get overwhelmed with it uh, because it does have to be done. You do need to repot these guys. 
Some growers will say they love to be pot bound. They do. They really do like to be pot bound and like to be snug in their containers, but uh, they don't like to be crazy pot bound. If you see roots coming up out of your pot or down below it, or your plant is leaning over so much it's getting top heavy, it's time to repot your plant. So uh, you want to keep your plant happy and healthy. Um, so you need to pay attention to whenever you did pot it, uh, and I'd usually do it about every other year, generally every year to every two years or so is fun. Um, and if you're wanting your plant to put on more mass, then you're going to have to give it more room and more soil uh, so that he can do that. Um, just a lot, a lot of light and water uh, will still stunt your plant because it won't have room to kind of spread out and put on more root mass and therefore get bigger. Now when you jump up pot sizes, uh, you do not want to jump up too quickly. Uh, like I said, mine's about a six inch pot and I'm going to 10 inch. Uh, but like I said, their root mass are crazy and uh, so they need a decent increase, about one to two inches generally. Uh, but if you end up going up too high, uh, one of two things is gonna end up happening. Uh, the first is that you're going to encourage or you're going to increase your chances of root rot with your pot whenever you go to water it. Um, and that is just because you've got too much soil and too much mass down there for all of that to dry out rather quickly, particularly if you do have a plastic pot like I have mine in. Uh, you really want it into maybe like a terracotta pot or a glazed pot or something like that that is a little porous, uh, that does breathe a little bit. Uh, now I have mine going in like a glazed seal pot so it won't be porous and it won't be able to breathe a whole lot. Uh, but it's better than the plastic ones, I think. Um, and like I said, uh, if it is too large, then you're going to have too much water in there and it won't dry out really quickly. Uh, so by the time you go to water it again, chances are it's going to still be wet and you're going to end up suffocating your roots uh, so they won't get oxygen and then they'll die from root rot. Now the second thing that can end up happening is your plant will end up trying to focus a lot of his attention on developing roots to kind of fill up that space and kind of get to his pot bound, uh, snug uh, position that he was in before. Um, so therefore he won't focus a lot of attention on uh, new leaves or uh, more branching or just getting taller. It'll uh, mostly go to developing roots down below to kind of fill the pot up. Uh, so you don't always have to repot. Uh, if you do like the container that you have it in, you can take it out and then kind of just loosen up what root mass you can uh, and then trim out some of the roots. Uh, now you don't want to trim more than about 20 to 25 percent of the root mass uh, because you can end up hurting your plant, uh, sending it into shock, or just kind of killing it off, uh, or anything like that. So whenever you do trim it, uh, you can actually keep it in the same container, um, and that'll keep it from actually having to get too full and uh, needing to repot. So that is the basic theory behind that, uh, is you don't always have to jump up to another pot size. You can always kind of just use a root rake and kind of get in there and kind of fluff up the roots a little bit and then kind of prune off uh, any of the excess roots that kind of hang around the outside that you can actually get to. And that'll uh, in turn create more space in the same container that you have. Now, if you go that route, that is fine. Just make sure that when you do put him back in the container, you use as much new uh, soil that you can uh, because uh, from being in a container for a couple of years, uh, they end up using a lot of their nutrients rather quickly. Uh, and if you don't put a whole lot in there, uh, it won't grow a whole lot or focus on growth. Um, and you'll end up stunting your plant. So always, always, always make sure you are feeding during the growing season at least every month for your fiddle leaf fig. Uh, and then once you go to repot him and you're or using the same container, uh, you put in a lot of organic material that uh, your plant can absorb. Uh, and a, a decent amount of new soil in there too. Now, as I said, uh, you really want to recreate the conditions uh, that the plant would normally encounter in its uh, natural environment. Uh, so that would be a lot of humidity. Typically, especially around the winter and fall, our houses don't have hardly any humidity in them at all. Most houses have maybe about 10% humidity and that's being a little generous. Uh, but 
fiddly figs like it somewhere around 65 percent so i would definitely if you have one of the smaller ones i would invest in like a pebble tray and uh puts a layer of rocks down and then fill up a bunch of water underneath that and set your plant on top now you got to be really careful with that because you don't want to set your pot in the water you want to have your pot up on the rocks and above the water so that as the water evaporates it'll come up through the leaves and kind of uh, give humidity your plant that way now if you're not using a pebble tray another way that you can use to kind of increase the humidity around your plant is to take a spray bottle and kind of spritz around your plant uh, that'll help but if your plant is as large as mine is spraying it or using a pebble tray will not suffice you're gonna actually have to use a humidifier and let me tell you, uh, I've got mine sitting rather close to the humidifier, and he absolutely loves it. Uh, so you'll want to pay special close attention to the humidity levels uh, for your ficus lorata. Uh, and like I said, somewhere around 60 to 65% is idea, but uh, you don't have to actually go up that high. Uh, but you do want to have a decent amount of humidity, especially around uh, the fall and winter and in the growing season as well. So just keep an eye on that. And then light, as I said always, uh, is rather intermediate. You don't need a whole lot of bright, indirect light. If you do, you will burn your leaves up really quickly uh, and stunt the growth and hurt the plant. Uh, so typically they say, you know, kind of an east-facing window is idea because they'll get ample morning light and then protection from the sun during the hotter part of the day. Uh, and like I said, I have mine in a south-facing window, but I've scooted in back some. Uh, and I've got blinds and a, and a curtain. So he's not getting a whole bunch of bright light there per se. Uh, but like I said, uh, the more light, the better. Uh, but there is a fine line. So you've got to be careful because you will scorch your leaves uh, and hurt your plant. Uh, but they do kind of like intermediate, kind of indirect sunlight, uh, if you will. Uh, when it comes to water, they like, they're about moderate drinkers because they are from the rainforest. So they do get a decent amount of water. So always make sure when you go to repot, you're using something that's organically rich in compost, uh, but also drains really well. Now, if you have a favorite kind of uh, soil that doesn't drain kind of like you want it to, you can get some uh, horticultural grade sand. Uh, and mix that in with it uh, and that'll help with the uh, drainage some perlite might help or uh, Pumice may help as well, but I always go the route of sand to kind of help with the drainage of the plants and the water retention uh, and then also pH with uh, ficus lorata is very important. They like it to be neutral about 6.5 on up to 7 is idea uh, and you don't want to go below 6 if you go below 6 you're really going to end up hurting your plant, if not killing it, uh, because too much acid in your soil uh, will keep your plant from absorbing the right amount of nutrients uh, that it needs, so it will stunt its growth. And you'll be able to tell that your plant is suffering from too much acidity in the soil because you'll see a lot of discoloration, a lot of yellowing, a lot of brown tips in the leaves, and essentially your plant will look kind of underfed. Uh, but you should test the soil uh, at least about twice a year to kind of see uh, what the acidity is uh, and you want to do kind of keep it a little bit uh, neutral <laughs> uh, and if you find that uh, your soil is really acidic uh, the best thing to do would be to repot it and remove as much of the old substrate as you could uh, and then if you can't go that route you can purchase some alkaline water drops uh, off Amazon. I want to say a bottle is around like $14. Um, and then you can put that in the water and water your plant that way. Uh, but yeah, just keep an eye on the acidity for the ficus lorata too because that can end up uh, killing your plant or at least stunting it. Now, one of my favorite things about this plant uh, is the look. Now, I know this one's looking kind of uh, janky and not up to snuff, but uh, like I said, they're called the fiddle leaf fig or the banjo fig because of the shape of the leaves. They do kind of resemble a fiddle or a violin. Uh, and because of the leaves, they're so uh, unique and like sophisticated and, and uh, the texture looks great. Uh, and, they're, and they're just great plants. And I know that you've gone around and on Pinterest and um, Twitter or any other kind of social media, you'll see a lot of 
uh, pictures of fiddle leaf figs because a lot of uh, people that sell homes, a lot of interior designers love to use this plant uh, because they are rather showy and uh, they really can bring a lot of attention into a room. Uh, and because of that, you can actually go pretty, I don't want to say wild, with your pot selection. Uh, but you want to actually do uh, choose a great pot to actually complement uh, the uniqueness and the sophistication of the look of the tree, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so with most other pots uh, and containers uh, for a plant, you got to be careful. Like if you've got a lot of flowers, you don't want uh, your container to overshadow or kind of overpower the flowers. Um, and I mean, there is a little bit of a science kind of behind what pot you should select with what plant you should select. Um, and with the ficus lorata, you can go a little bit more fancy. I know a lot of you have seen, uh, they, they'll sit the grow pots or a container in kind of a, like a, a woven kind of basket of grass or seagrass or switchgrass. Uh, and those look really cool. Or you can get away with a lot of kind of like whites and blues in a pot. Or you can use some of these really nice cachet pots uh, like I've got right here. And I'm going to move my isopropyl alcohol. Um, that's what I always, always say is always clean out your container before you put your new one in. And if you're going to be using any tools, make sure you sanitize those as well. Now I'll wash this bad boy out with some soap and water, hot soap and water. Uh, because you don't know what's set down in it, where these pots have been, and for how long, and who's picked them up, and who's touched them. If anything's died down in there. So uh, always clean your containers out before you put a new plant in them. Even if it's uh, one you've had forever, go ahead and clean it out before you put a new plant in there. <laughs> so I think I chose a rather nice one for this uh, tree. Um, and like I said, it is a little bit of a jump, but it's not too much. Uh, but you got to be careful with these containers too uh, if you don't have a lot of time to invest into them uh, because they can end up holding a lot of water because of the saucer underneath. So when you do water it, uh, you always want your container to have a lot of drainage holes in there to let the excess drain out. But this has got this saucer underneath it, so whenever I water it, I'll wait a couple of minutes and then be sure to tip the container over to let the excess drain out. Uh, if you leave your ficus lorata in a lot of soggy, saturated soil, your plant will die rather quickly. So make sure you always drain the excess out <laughs> and you have soil uh, that will be okay with uh, draining that. Now, what I'm gonna do is I've got my little bucket down here to catch any of this debris from all this soil. And I'm going to gently take my legs, put the pot in between my legs and just kind of squeeze with my legs to kind of loosen what I can of the uh, root mass. Now, you gotta be very careful because you can end up snapping. So I've got one hand on the container, one hand on the center of the stem, and I'm gonna gently turn the bucket over and dump all this excess soil out into the container. And Buddha's like, what are you doing? I'm trying to sleep. You really don't want to do what I did um, and I watered mine right before I decided to actually transplant him uh, and that was my bed uh, but uh, a lot of that excess soil fell right off so it does make it a little bit easier to water it some but if you water it as much as I did uh, your root mass is going to really kind of fall apart and you're going to end up with a little tiny little spot of a root mass and uh, that doesn't really kind of show you what you would have if uh, you left your plant pretty much dry and didn't water it. You would have probably a huge mound or brick or a huge mass of uh, roots and soil. So I can't tell if I did something good or bad. I know the last time I transplanted one, uh, there was a good amount of mass that I had to actually kind of sift through with my root rake and my root hook. And this one wasn't that bad, so. Now you wanna go up to about less than half uh, with your soil and kinda of pack it down just a little bit, just kinda of gently pack it down. You don't wanna like mash it all down. And then you wanna kinda of make an indention in the center probably where the root mass will sit. 
comfortably. And uh, now I use this indoor potting mix from miracle Grow, uh, and it's great. This stuff is a soilless media that does not attract any kind of bug that is attracted to soil, kind of your aphids or your mites or anything like that. Uh, so I found this out a couple years back, and I use it as much as I can unless I'm using the uh, cacti soil and uh, citrus mix uh, because that has a lot of sand in it and helps a lot with the actual drainage and water retention. Now I'm going to go ahead and put this whole first bag in there and then just kind of mix it up a little bit and kind of punch down in the center there to make a little divot. You don't want the plant to sit down so far in the soil. You want it up a little bit less than halfway, uh, depending on how large yours is. Now, I'm going to go ahead and see, show you that root mass right there. It's rather small. And it's wet. Woo! Makes me nervous. Grab my next bag. is just kind of filling in soil down around uh, in between the root mass and the container. Just to kind of fill it up. When you get it mostly full, you want to uh, kind of support it at the top with one hand and hold the plant and your other hand you want to take it and kind of lightly or gently just kind of press on the soil you want to tamp it down as best you can uh, you're not trying to break any of the roots uh, they are a little bit on the smaller thinner side kind of uh, stringy and finicky uh, so it wouldn't take a whole lot to kind of uh, break your roots but gently press down to kind of remove any air bubbles that might be in the soil. And then go ahead and add in more soil until you get it exactly where you want it to be. All right, now I went ahead and removed its old uh, gardening twine. I had him up on a stake before. And now I'll go ahead and stick the new one down in there. So when you're doing this, be very careful. You don't want to go right uh, where the root mass is because you can end up puncturing a lot of the roots. And therefore uh, causing harm to your plant. Now you want to kind of go up on the side uh, where there isn't a whole lot of leaves so that uh, when it does grow it's not going to be rubbing up against uh, the support and uh, create like an opening uh, or a, a wound for uh, rot or fungus or pest to kind of enter uh, because if you do that then you are going to be out of luck and you could end up killing your plant. Now it looks like I'm not going to have to secure him too tight uh, because of uh, his stake here. I think I've got a good spot for him. So I'm going to go ahead and cut off some gardening twine and then secure him to his steak. I keep saying steak and I want a steak, I'm hungry. If you are doing this and you are securing a plant, any tree or any vegetable or any flower or anything to a gardening steak, make sure you leave ample room in between there. Uh, you don't wanna do it so tight that, like I said, you're gonna be up against your steak and you're gonna uh, rub it raw uh, because that will create an opening for pest and disease and rot and all that to enter your plant and potentially kill it. So keep an eye on that and monitor it rather safely and securely and I think this one will be okay. All right, now this uh, gardening steak, uh, sturdy steak rather, is 72 inches tall, so I think this will be okay. And it will actually hold him in there. 
Now, uh, with these fiddle leaf figs, they don't get too large. Like I said, I think in uh, nature, they get down to about uh, 40 to 50 feet, maybe 60 feet at the absolute tallest. Uh, but indoors, they usually get about 10 foot or so. Uh, so it won't get too crazy. And if it does, uh, we have a secret weapon. Always, 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 if your plant gets too tall, whether it's a cactus or a flower, which, you know, there's only one flower that gets really tall, uh, or a tree, bonsai, whatever, um, you can actually prune it back. And uh, you just kind of want to prune it a little bit further, uh, a little bit below the top, uh, and pruning it, kind of pinching it back, will actually encourage it to actually branch out more. Uh, and then it'll also give you a lot of room and actually won't kill your plant. Uh, now, propagating these fiddle leaf figs, I've seen video and pictures of people propagating fiddle leaf figs from a leaf. I've never had luck with that, and I've never known anyone to actually grow a fiddle leaf fig from a leaf cutting. But uh, from a stem cutting, you can actually propagate one. Uh, so if you do cut yours back, uh, don't throw the top part away because if you have... Uh, probably about a foot, maybe a little bit less of a stem, you can actually grow a new plant. You can use some rooting hormone, though I don't think you always have to, uh, but uh, always make sure you take 100% cinnamon and cover up any cuts on your plant uh, because cinnamon is a natural antibiotic uh, and will actually kind of fight back uh, any kind of pest or disease from actually entering your plant. Uh, so you would take the top cutting and let it callus over some, keep it kind of moist and let it callus over and then you can actually repot it uh, and you'll get a new tree out of it. But like I said, I don't think you can actually do that from a leaf cutting, though I've seen people claim that you can. Now, true, they will develop roots, but that's more of an aesthetic kind of showy process, not anything that will actually help the plant out. Uh, and absorb a whole bunch of moisture and nutrients and go that route for the plant. Now, the, one of the last things I wanted to talk about with this tree uh, is its leaves. Uh, actually, a lot of growers swear by the fiddle leaf fig uh, because they can actually purify a lot of the air. They're up there with like peace lilies and other plants that can actually purify a lot of the air, so they are great plants to have. And as they get taller and bigger, that's more air that they can actually clean. So uh, it's great to have one of these guys, but you gotta actually kinda keep them clean. And as you can tell, my leaves are a little bit dusty, but not a whole lot. Uh, but I try to check them uh, every so often, maybe about once a month, and I, what I'll do to clean them is take a, a nice little soft washcloth, and I'll take about four parts warm, lukewarm water, not hot, don't hurt your plant. Uh, and then one part lemon juice and mix that together and then dip your uh, washcloth in there and kind of go over the tops of the leaves. Now that's safe to actually use on the bottom if you want to clean that on the bottom too. Uh, but cleaning your leaves uh, will help them photosynthesize more and process more light and actually keep more of the uh, air purified and clean. So always check uh, these leaves. They are rather large and showy and can attract a lot of dust and dirt. Uh, so they will get really dirty really easily uh, and I would check them about once a month. The last thing I wanna talk about is the pests. Uh, they don't have a ton in the way of pests, though they do have some. Uh, I wanna say spider mites, mealybugs, aphids, fungus gnats are a big problem with them and that's why I'm actually using uh, this indoor potty mix that is a soilless media because it won't attract a bunch of uh, soil loving insects into the uh, soil especially when the soil is wet. Now I know a lot of like fungus gnats and uh, aphids and stuff will uh, be attracted to a lot of uh, wet soil so this uh, whenever you water it uh, you don't have to worry about it attracting a bunch of uh, pests. Now, before, I had all that um, gnat nicks on top, uh, but I don't like that. Uh, it is kind of carcinogenic and can get down in your lungs, um, and is bad for any kind of animals you have. So, uh, be very careful if you use uh, any kind of uh, 
Nat Nix or go that route. Like I said, I think it's uh, way more cost effective and healthier to use a kind of soilless media so that uh, these bugs won't be attracted to it. Uh, but all you need to do really is just kind of take a bright light like on your cell phone or a flashlight and kind of look over your plants. Uh, maybe once a month whenever you're kind of uh, washing the leaves off, use your cell phone to kind of look underneath everything uh, and look down on every stem. Uh, and you can see it's got a lot of these kind of growth over here from the leaves. Uh, and a lot of insects can use that to their advantage and kind of hide out in there. So uh, look it over with a bright light and see if you need to see anything that looks like it's moving around or looks like uh, maybe like a spider's web or any kind of filament uh, because you may have spider mites or you may have an infestation. Uh, but if you're not sure, take a picture and send it to me. Uh, if you're on my Instagram, I get on there all the time and uh, you can send me a message and I'll see what you have and tell you the best way to actually kind of fight that back. Uh, but if you're, you stay ever vigilant and check up on them always, uh, your plant will remain a little bit more healthy and won't have any problems. Well guys, that's really all I wanted to say about this plant. Like I said, it's one of my favorite plants to have. It's showy, uh, and it's a great potted plant pal. Uh, so I love my ficus lorata, uh, and, and, and they're great. They really are. So um, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, uh, leave them in the comments below and let me know what you think about it. I know there's kind of a mixed review out there. A lot of people love them. A lot of people say it's not worth the fuss and the trouble. Uh, but let me know what you think about this plant uh, and if you've ever had any kind of success or failures with them. Uh, and while you're at it, hit the subscribe button or the bell next to it. That way you'll know anytime I've uploaded a new video. Until next time, guys, always plant prudently. Thank you, YouTube.